Hey everyone, welcome to Freedom Solutions. We have another episode here today, which is actually focused on listener uh, questions and uh, really just you, of course. Uh, so we grabbed a really good question that we thought was uh, important to actually walk through on the show, um, go over on the show, and then you know go into detail. So uh, we want and encourage everyone to write in uh, questions, of course. Uh, we'd certainly love to have people on the show as well. Um, we're kind of starting to queue up people so we can get them on call-in shows. And in addition, there are some people that uh, we're looking to interview. So if you're interested in being on the show or if you're interested in uh, having your questions kind of walk through on the show, feel free to write to us at uh, freedomsolutionsdao uh, at gmail.com. We'll provide the link and everything else below. Uh, it's actually freedomdao at gmail.com. And uh, we actually have a domain and a website spinning up pretty soon, so you'll be able to access all our content from the website in a more orderly fashion than just YouTube. Uh, but it'll also have our contact information there. But feel free to contact us if you're interested at all in um, actually you know, having your questions talked about on the show, uh, and we will certainly do our best to have answers for you. So uh, without further ado, we're going to actually go into this particular listener's questions. This is uh, Listener Thoughts, Episode 0. So the question is, how can we create a global democracy without government? And, you know, that, that initial kind of phrase, the word democracy, of course, entail, uh, entails a certain things. It has certain connotations to some people. Uh, the literal meaning, of course, is, um, you know, wrapped around the, the idea of some form of governance body which is representative of all of the people or at least a majority of the people within the kind of the uh, political body right that it represents and so this could be something in theory like just a standard business organization where uh, there's like a, a 51 percent plus voting uh, population within the business where 51 percent of them are represented and um, that's how they kind of arbitrate decisions uh, in a more common or public scenario where there's not a direct investment in a particular organization, this, of course, manifests itself in government. And so, you know, I wanted to clarify what this meant because democracy also means to a lot of people um, individual rule, individual influence or influence of the people. And so I kind of wanted to make sure I understood what was what was actually being asked. Right. So. I wrote back a couple questions. I said, well, what do you mean by global democracy? What value, you know, is this providing to you? Um, what do you mean uh, uh, by global, by democracy in of itself? So, my, okay, my first question was basically, why do you need a global democracy? Like, you know, what, what, what are kind of some of the manifestations of that, which, you know, kind of clarifying what they mean by global and democracy? And then what is the value? And, of course, I went into... Uh, what do they mean by democracy, right? Because there's it's very open for interpretation these days. And then finally, um, obviously, a democracy is a means to an end. What's your end goal? Like, what you know, what are you trying to accomplish with all this? And so, um, I actually got back a really awesome reply, <laughs> uh, really well thought out. Um, this person actually I've I've kind of known for a little bit, and um, he actually has a well thought out reply. And this is a very intelligent response and and so I thank this person for this um, so his key counters or key key replies to these words basically democracy may not be the best form to describe it um, or the best form to solve it but he's looking for some ways to ensure self-rule at a global scale so the key words here are seeking a solution which ensure self-rule on a global scale right um, the other thing that he clarified for me was democracy to him means equal access to defining acceptable societal practices and how to deal with deviations from globally defined self-interest equilibrium, right? And so his key point here was basically wrapped around how do we work together, right? How do we have all these despairing cultures, uh, disparate cultures, um, disparate governments today, uh, all these other kind of incentives that either a group of people have or discrete individual has 
and how do we bring them all together so that we're not just fighting and arguing and you know, attacking each other and having wars and just conflict continues to persist, right? How do we avoid the conflicts that we've had in the past and that continue to persist today? Um, what is the system to solve that? Uh, especially if we don't have a government, right? You know, how, how do we manage conflict resolution and all this stuff? So his next bullet kind of goes into that. He goes, well, okay, then... Um, the elimination of antiquated forms of societal organization and dispute resolution. So, so to him, he was saying well, he's trying to find a solution that provides that. How do we eliminate these antiquated forms of government and or, uh, organization and solve for dispute resolution, right? Because that's the key reason why I would say most people feel like government exists is to kind of be that arbitrator, right? To kind of be the rational objective, ideally third party arbitrator that could, you know, help judge or decide on issues, um, you know, that, that, that come up when people have conflicts. And this could be anything from, of course, a, a violent threat, sorry, a violent scenario where someone has aggressed against someone else. And of course, they want to investigate and make sure that they understand who, who did what and what the reason was and what the motive was and, you know, thus what the penalty should be. And then all the way to um, something more business centric, like who breached a contract and uh, who lied to who, etc. You know, all those other kind of civil type things. And so all these things are necessary, right? Since we deal with human beings and there's um, a lot of gray area in between one agreement or one person's understanding of an agreement and another and oftentimes conflict arises because people are judgmental and all sorts of other things so it's like well how do we actually solve for that if we don't have a government so all great questions and this is actually kind of one of the corner cornerstones um of what we're trying to do right with freedom solutions dao and we think we have the answer to this and so we're going to go into what we feel the answer is so to answer that, to, to really answer his questions and kind of solve some of his concerns, um, we have to go into uh, some of the very specific components that he's getting into in terms of uh, how do we solve this for the globe, right? This is, this is a big challenge. How do we um, ensure that there's still acceptable societal practices in the sense that, uh, you know, one group may choose to do drugs, right? One group may choose to um define age of consent at you know 14 and get married at 14 or something like that and how do we kind of balance those those differences out on a global scale when we're dealing with such a, a vast amount of, of different opinions different backgrounds different cultures different ways of life like di people survive in a different way in south africa than they do in north america right totally different ecosystem totally different world so um, we've got to walk through all those and we've got to figure out kind of how we solve these. And so the answer really comes to down to the fact that there is no one answer for everyone. There's only the ability to enable freedom of choice for everyone to up and to the point that someone initiates violence against someone else. So, you know, what we have to do is, as as a species is we have to stop judging people, right? We have to stop you know, saying, okay, well, your preferences over here, you know, individual or group of people over here, because they're not the same as mine, that's bad, right? We need to stop that concept of judging. We need to stop that concept of telling other people what to do. And where we need to come together is when it when it makes sense right when it when we come together we need to come together so we can execute in the marketplace so there's you know there's this concept of of nep and it's something that i've kind of mentioned in the past but i want to go into a little bit because i think it really is the answer to all of this there's only one rule anyone needs to follow and that's the non-aggression principle and the non-aggression principle is uh the concept that you have no right to initiate force against someone else. You have no right to give up rights that you don't have. So there's no, so because you have no right to initiate force against someone else, you could not give the right to initiate force to someone else like government. So you can, can give it to a third party like IBM and say, hey, go, you know, steal a bunch of money and give it to the poor. It just, it wouldn't work, right? It would, it's illogical because you don't have that right yourself. Therefore, you you cannot logically give that right to someone else. 
And so we do that today with government, which is where I think a lot of, you know, when you go back to the question, a lot of the question is, you know, kind of stuck on or, or concerned about is the fact that we have government today and because the way government operates in a, a an aggressive way, in a way that initiates force and says, well, it's a representation of the people, but the people don't have the right themselves, right? I can I can never go to some random person on the on the street and say, well, I'm going to take your wallet and I have every right to take your wallet because I'm going to give it to someone else uh, who's poor and hungry or dying on the street and therefore it's justified. No, you have no right to do that. You have no right to aggress against that person that steal. And whatever you do with that after you've you've stolen is no longer is, is of no value. It doesn't matter if you've solved all the world's problems, but you've stolen from someone else. It's just completely irrational. It makes no sense. And and so thus we cannot give that power to a third party. Uh, and the third party being government. And government, anyway, is just made up of individuals. And these individuals are doing these. There's nothing magical about government that makes it special or, or better than you or better than anyone else. It's, it's just this, this magical philo philosophy of the, of the idea that, that somewhere we can, we can throw good stuff in this centralized apparatus called government and good things will happen, <laughs> which, which is insane. Like it just, it makes no logical sense. There's no way for you to provide that right to a third party, no matter what you call it, right? Or no matter what its intent is um, outside of, you know, if it initiates force. So anyway, to start to solve that, the actual problem, NAP is really the answer. So, you know, NAP or following or applying NAP in action is how we achieve this end. Now, as an example, you, you know, as an example, you basically are able to create these segments. So one of the, one of the bigger challenges in his question was, okay, well, there's a global base of people and they don't have a common even a common language have you know m most of the time we have hundreds of languages across the planet we don't have a common uh, background we may not have a common uh you know theology some of some you know they may be anarchists they may be uh people who believe in different types of gods uh there may be people who believe in uh, you know, like I said, different preferences across the globe that may differ uh, strongly from 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 some other people's preferences, right? Uh, but the implementation of that rule is how we live our lives today. So, as an example, uh, we pick our friends through the basis of NAP. We do not aggress against other people to choose our friends. We do not aggress against other people when we choose to not associate with other people. So as an example, if you're part of a church and you're, you know, that's your community and you interact with these people, you, you choose not to interact with perhaps, or perhaps not interact with the atheist next door because that person does not have the same uh, preferences as you do right and these are all preferences there's nothing necessarily moral or immoral until you initiate force right and i think and then we can we can kind of go into how we can prove this as being true uh through universally preferable behavior but i'll link to that because uh, i don't want to you know i don't want to delve into another 30 minutes of, of what upb means but the idea is is basically that um again no one would prefer force to be initiated against them and thus that's the only moral code we have to follow everything else again becomes preference but by applying an ap both in a in a fashion where you can choose to associate you voluntarily choose to associate with the people you want to and you can voluntarily choose to not associate with the people you don't want to thus we start to solve the problems of grouping wrapped around or collaboration wrapped around uh, people with disparate principles or disparate backgrounds where you know one group of people is say an atheist and another group of people is say very uh, religious and they want to come together to collaborate on certain things such as perhaps building a road or keeping their neighborhood safe or whatever but beyond that they don't really want to interact well then that's how the free market works right the free market is the ability for people to interact without 
you know, care or concern about what your principles necessarily are. You can, they can certainly be a part of it if you choose. You can certainly have a business which says, well, I only care about the uh, servicing religious people and I don't care about servicing atheists. It's perfectly fine. It's your choice. It's your business model. Um, you know, you're, you're automatically eliminating a certain subset of your total addressable market, right? But that's your choice, right? And maybe your business can be successful on that model. You know, it, it all depends. And, and so that's where the market comes into play to kind of start to solve some of these differences, but enabling us to collaborate because the incentive to survive, the incentive to collaborate where it matters, such as the, such as skill divest, uh, diversification um, is, is where we start to amplify our ability to help each other, right? Our ability to survive, our ability to collaborate, our ability to, to help one another. This is where you know, people come together is in the marketplace because you don't necessarily need to care about uh, your social principles. You can care about uh, the principles of helping each other through, you know, increasing someone's survival by providing a product or an innovation in the marketplace. So, so anyway, when you start to apply NAP, you can now apply that globally and all of these different disparate groups can kind of come together and they don't have to necessarily agree on things outside of the fact that they want to come in together to accomplish one particular project or one particular goal or whatever that is right so whether it's defense or whether it's a road or whether it's um, exchanging goods all those things do not require that necessarily that you really care about the the social principles that this person follows right and and how do we get people to, to start to take this on as an actionable principle? So it's great to talk about NAP. It's great to say, yes, it's the answer to all the world's ills and we should all be following it, etc. But how do we actually get people to use NAP and apply it in, in their daily life, right? So especially on the globe, so it's it's kind of easier to say, well, NAP exists and it's, and it's kind of the default state of all things where, um, you know, I get to choose my friends, I get to choose, you know, my spouse, I get to choose my career and the things I do. And so thus I'm applying NAP every day. But how do we get that to expand to all facets of life across the globe? And again, it's, it is, it is easier to do in a microcosm of say like a local geo, geo, like a local geography, um, say in a state or say in a city where you can try to get maybe 30,000 people to follow NAP and not necessarily have to rely on government in any way, shape or form. But how do you spend it globally? So the, the, the way to move this shift from a localized phenomenon, like you, you, your family, your friends, into um or even cities to some degree into a broader scale solution is you have to build a system so you have to build a system and a system consists of incentives and disincentives right and so the incentives since, since we're following nap we can never have a disincentive which is violence right we can never initiate force as a disincentive like government does today but we can provide incentives which you know generally like lower cost of goods uh, lower cost of services, better services, like better self-defense, better roads, better, you know, whatever else uh, that people find of value. Uh, but we can never use violence as a disincentive, right? We, we can just, we can only say, hey, well, we're not going to associate with you. And, you know, that drives a disincentive. So um, as we walk through this, we're going to go into kind of some of the details wrapped around this. But basically the idea is that in order to get people to actually apply the answer, right? So the answer is NAP. So we want everyone to apply the non-aggression principle in their daily life. That will enable everyone across the globe to participate with each other in a nonviolent fashion, not requiring government and enabling the marketplace to solve the multitude of interests, the spirit interests that everyone has. Like we mentioned earlier, like maybe there's a neighborhood um uh area where there's a bunch of anarchists live uh anar or sorry not anarchists but atheists live in an another neighborhood with a bunch of uh, christians live right and you know they choose to commingle with each other because they prefer the social choices that one groups make versus the other group 
right? And vice versa. And so the idea is, is that's a free market solution to free grouping and free association of people, right? as an example. And, you know, of course, it reduces conflict. It reduces, you know, independent, independent individual personal conflict. Um, and it enables people to come together and collaborate when it makes sense. So maybe they collaborate on, on maintaining the road. And then you get together for a road meeting and they talk about what they should do with the road and they go home, right? And yeah, maybe they do talk. Maybe, maybe some people don't care. Maybe, maybe the Christians are trying to, you know, get the, save the souls of the atheists or something like that. It, 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 it happens today. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with people collaborating and, and trying to, uh, you know, convince people of their own social preferences. Um, but it's but it's but you can never force people to do that right you it's, it's just it, it's morally wrong it's mathematically wrong like you, at that point you're now stealing from that person's life if you try to force them either through you know theft of the past which is the wealth or theft of the present which is the freedom or theft of the future which is the life right that's all it's all immoral and everyone agrees it's immoral because nobody would want that to happen to them right so anyway so we all know that's the principle we all know that's the solution now how do we get the solution to be implemented Right. That's where decentralization comes in. So we're going to go into this and talk a little bit about more. But the idea is the system that we're building of incentives and decentives, uh, disincentives is all wrapped around decentral decentralization. And what we mean by decentralization is not only is it a business model whereby we're taking core business functions that represent a particular market segment. So like I just said, maybe there's a market segment of Christians and they have a particular need. And then there's a market a market segment of atheists, and they have a particular need. Well, all of these things can be properly expressed in the marketplace and funded in the marketplace and representative of that particular group, all without violence, right? All without initiating force, all while being able to scale independent of what other people believe. So in a transitionary phase where there's non-aggression principle being applied and yet say maybe we have a bunch of aggressive countries that still exist let's just say for during this model we'll walk through and we'll say the united states of america today dissolves and north america becomes a, a non-aggression principle based community of people working together but we still have all the rest of the world that have nuclear bombs and military and all this other stuff and you know they're they're like hey easy target right <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna solve some of those potential concerns and and how we can mitigate those um so one of the key things with decentralization um, both from a business model perspective as well as a technical model perspective is that it can't be stopped right so you can't stop something that is comprised of either a significant multitude of people talking you know hundreds of thousands to potentially millions of people you know basically at that point it becomes exponentially hard to use violence to actually stop a system which is comprised of that many people right so that's that's the core foundation of why decentralization is so important from a technology perspective it ensures availability of the service or of the function that's being provided into the marketplace for these particular groups that is as well of highly available like it's impossible for or functionally impossible for a decentralized application or service to be shut down by any government uh, because there's hundreds of thousands of nodes or even tens of thousands of nodes you need you need a, a basically an n times x amplification of force so you need something like say for every 10,000 nodes, you need 100,000 nodes, right? To take down 10,000 nodes. Um, and so as the scale keeps going up in a decentralized type technology model or a decentralized organizational model, it takes more and more force to stop a decentralized solution, right? And then thus at some point it becomes impossible. And, and even so, even if, especially in a, in a decentralized technology model, even if you go into this world where, okay, hey, I'm able to, you know, stop 100,000 people um, through violence or, you know, some other form of disincentive like like excessive taxation or incarceration or whatever, the idea still exists. And then when you when applied to a technology model, then you can't stop the technology. And then just, you know, more people keep hopping on it. 
And the we the way we incentivize the kind of irrational actors, the violent actors to hop onto a decentralized system is because the cost of operating a decentralized system is is basically exponentially less than building a centralized system, both from a technology model as well as a operate business operational model, right? And we're going to go into that. But the basic idea is that you really cannot stop a decentralized system and your incentives uh, are what's going to drive people like flies you know uh, like moths to a flame right to, into your system because they're going to see that they're better off by participating in the decentralized system whether they know that they're participating in it or not than when they're participating in the current system so things like um, devaluation of your currency doesn't happen in a decentralized system so you're not losing value of your money while it's you know as soon as you earn it uh, things like taxation doesn't exist in a decentralized system it kind of becomes voluntary at that point because you can't really figure out who's exchanging money or or who has the money or whatever right so it really becomes a significant challenge to create external threats to the system at that point right and then you could always exchange value in a in a decentralized token world kind of like cryptocurrencies where you know there is no counterparty threats because you you know the counterparty say government would have to understand what you're doing and how you're doing it and and there's plenty of ways to obfuscate and and kind of cover those things right so so at some point it just becomes a a no value proposition for a third party to inflict violence on you while you use a decentralized system because they can't get anything out of you and they can't stop you right maybe they stop 10 people right and then and then 20,000 more people come on board because then they see that well okay they can only stop 10 people but they can't stop everyone else right so um so it's really important to understand that the means by which we get NAP to be applied in everyone's daily life is via some form of a decentralized system and uh, we'll go into a couple of the specifics as an example. So the other part of his question was about dispute resolution. This is a very good one. This is this is really, you know, okay, now we've gotten rid of government. We have a, a key principle that we all live by now. We all live by the non-aggression principle. So we're not aggressing against people. And we have a means of implementing that through a decentralized, you know, kind of peer-to-peer -peer system. And but now we still have human nature, right? So we have vagaries of memory. So sometimes like, uh, I, you know, I've been doing uh, massive, massive contracts most of my life for, for say, almost 20 years, right, in, in enterprise organizations. And what's codified in a contract is, I would say, 60% of the real understanding of the agreement between two parties. Right. So when you sign a contract, when you're signing a SAO, when you're signing a master services agreement, when you're signing a contract to do something, you're you're trying to codify or you know identify in, in, in paper as much as humanly possible the intent that one human being or or a couple human human beings on one party and a, a few other human beings on another side of the party are are mutually agreeing to. So first off, you have the idea right which is in my you know in what we'll just use a one-to-one -one relationship example but say in my brain and then you have the idea that's being formed in the other person's brain say the consumer and in these these two worlds the idea is you know as, as crystal clear as we can get it right as crystal clear as humans can have an idea it's embodied in in our brains and in, in on my thoughts and in, in this other person's thoughts Right now, when we when we communicate to each other, there's already some loss of integrity of that idea as we move forward. Right. So we, we start to automatically lose the integrity or the quality of that idea as we start to communicate it. Like if we if we were Vulcan mind melding right here, you would totally understand, <laughs> you know, freedom and decentralization. And, and I would never have to, you know, do another video again. And it would be really simple. But the. Um, but but human language can only express so much right and so what we're trying to do as we go further with that now into paper is we're losing yet even more of the quality of that idea it's because we're going from the conscious 
conscious brain into you know written into verbal world into oral world into uh, written world and we're trying to ensure we can encapsulate all of what our intent is and the other person's intent right this is why law exists this is why le legal practices exist this is why um you know arbitration dispute resolution all these other things exist right so anyway so this this, this problem's never going to go away because it's just human nature there's there's a way through technology and smart contracts in the crypto world like ethereum and a few others uh, rootstock and a few others that basically enable us to codify in code the intent as much as possible into a smart contract and so when you go after the smart contract kind of like going like like when you use bitcoin as a perfect example you you understand when you're using bitcoin basically what it is you understand that it's a token that represents value that you can use to uh, spend you can use to receive this value you can use to store this value in your wallet and those basic functions you you understand right and so it's it's codified as we would say in code to do these things that you expect now a user may expect Bitcoin just like any other contract right that we have um, either verbal or written to you know cook them breakfast in the morning who knows right <laughs> but that's not reality and so how we test contracts in a new in the new digital smart contract world is in order to prove them we use small amounts of risk or small amounts of spend like say you know a fraction we spend a fraction of a Bitcoin we send it to another wallet we test it and we say, okay, did that do what I had intended it to do? That's that's the testing culture kind of mindset that's that's the future of all interaction, right? Can I test and validate that this thing does what I expect it to do? It's just like how we test our friends. Like when we first meet someone, we don't have 100% confidence that this person has our best interest at heart, right? So. You know, we through the interactions and through the challenges of life, we test that person's mettle, right? We get to know whether they're a good friend or they're not, or they they lie or they don't lie. And so just because just like any other form of human interaction, there's always gonna be vagaries until you know you feel confident. And then and then it could always change. Like down the road, my best friend could turn into my worst enemy because of an incentive or disincentive or misinterpretation or something like that, right? Or or maybe I failed and I did something wrong to him, right? So so anyway, the whole point is is that the there as long as humans exist, there's always going to be some form of dispute resolution or some form of acceptable risk where you have to say, okay, I'm going to interact with the system or I'm going to interact with these people, and I know that you know 25% of the time it's going to fail and it it just is what it is or it's not going to meet my intentions, right? Um, and so, so how do we solve this? How do we build for more complex things than just sending a you know a few Bitcoin or, or a few pieces of value? How do we how do we solve disputes on say massive things? Like let's say um, you know someone claims that you murder their neighbor, right? Um, how do we solve these things in a free market where government doesn't exist? And that's what we're going to walk through in this this particular slide. So. Now that we've now that we've found the solution, we've found a way to implement the solution, and now we we still have some you know remainder uh, challenges left over where basically dispute resolution will help solve the vagaries between human relationships and arbitrate them. What, what's the what's the solution behind that? What's the implementation of that? So so beyond just NAP or this becomes a subset of NAP really is we'll need a couple things. We'll need um, of some form of safety. So this is both individualized safety as well as um, uh, group safety, right? So the individualized safety in a free market is, is something that we're actually working on at Freedom Solutions DAO. We're actually building a piece of software called UberGuard at this point in time, it's kind of the current name. And um, it basically is a marketplace for bodyguards, for, you know, private security where you're doing with like large building, large complex, maybe an apartment complex, maybe a corporate building uh, security and private investigators. And the idea here is that by building a decentralized system 
of say of a safety marketplace we can allow all sorts of people anyone who wants to be or provide their services uh, on the marketplace who wants to be you know perhaps a bodyguard or or a security firm or private investigator can sell their services on the marketplace right and so this is another example that already exists today although it's heavily heavily regulated and it shouldn't be and um, that can enable us to have decentralized safety right and then the only reason why it's heavily regulated today is not to protect you it's because they don't want competition <laughs> government doesn't want competition to the services that they claim they provide right which they don't they don't really provide safety. I mean, it's a whole other show, but um, the whole idea is, is basically that's one of the core pillars we need to solve, right? Then for collectivized defense or larger scale defense, let's, you know, in the scenario, like we said, America is now or uh, become an NAP society. Everyone's individuals, you know, we're all just kind of collaborating where we need to through the marketplace and through um, uh, how we choose to through, through social, through uh, kind of collaborating with people we agree with from a social principle perspective. So our friends, our, our communities um, that we have, our micro communities that we voluntarily have chosen. So churches or sports teams or whatever, right? All these voluntary ways to collaborate outside of government um, all still exist. And they're all now even more empowered. And now you have more capital because government's not selling from you to kind of make these things richer. Uh, how do we keep other governments that still exist at this, you know, kind of in this timeline to, to keep from aggressing against us? Well, one of the first solutions would be to build um, what we, we've kind of coined in the freedom world as, uh, as a DRO. And this DRO insurance company would basically, you would pay into this insurance company uh, voluntarily. I mean, you don't have to pay. Some, some people are going to pay, some people aren't. And you're going to define, of course, you know, what your level of risk is and where you feel you need, you need to put your money. But now that you're not paying or not being stolen from, from government and all, you have all this, you have about 50% of your income back, you can now pay for other things like that actually are effective and they're accountable to you uh, because, you know, the marketplace solutions, which you, you have direct accountability over. And these insurance companies would do something like provide a, uh, you know, an audit of all of the governments on the planet and say, look, hey, then we have about 300 members of our insurance company, or let's just say 150 million people sign up for a, a kind of a, a government protection insurance company. And they're saying, look, we have 100 million members. We they want to make sure that you're not going to aggress against us. They have we have complete unilateral free trade. So we trade freely with you you know, uh, Russia, Middle East, whatever, whoever, China, uh, all we ask is you do not initiate violence against us and you go about your business, right? And so the idea is, is that, you know, we would, to, to layer that in deeper, we would say, okay, well, if you want to do business with us, because of course the US and the America would still be the largest economic powerhouse on the planet. And I would argue, and a lot of economists would argue, if we had complete freedom, we would, we would exponentially amplify that because everyone would say, hey, well, I want to do business with these people because I don't have to go through the overhead of all the false regulatory practices that aren't really valuable and aren't accountable to the people who are actually doing business or the consumers. Uh, and now I can you know, reap the benefits of all that. So, so people would want to do business with us. People will want to actually move here and start their own companies here and operate under this this world of of freedom and so there's when you're trading with someone no one's gonna say okay well it's more valuable for me to trade with these people or less valuable for me to trade with these people than it is to kill them like it just doesn't make sense nobody's gonna go like yeah all right well i'm gonna trade with these people and then I'm just going to murder them all. Like, it doesn't make any sense. So there would be this um, insurance company, which would be also in verifying and ensuring that these other governments follow along with our agreements, because otherwise they either couldn't trade with us or they would perhaps just make it aware, make make the make the public aware through reports and um, news, you know, information that would be published through the news media, which would say, hey, like, uh, the Middle East or Russia or whoever, right, is building up a an arms base and there's, you know, threats that they'll be coming over to America, you know, which is now completely free. 
and uh, to, to kind of invade our country or something like that. Well, we would know, we would get prepared, we would build whatever we need to if, we, if there was an imminent threat uh, that we need to defend ourselves from, which, which is, again is all kind of ridiculous, right? There's no reason if we're trading with everyone that they'll want to attack us. It's like Switzerland. Switzerland's been this bastion of unmolested country throughout uh, some of the worst periods of, of industrialized military warfare because of the fact that they've traded with everybody unilaterally and and they haven't pissed anybody off i mean it's just as simple as that and so so when you get out of this world of of kind of government collectivism there's nothing to attack like like what is the strategic benefit to another country to attack something that isn't a country it's like it's like russia coming over and bombing me like like what's the value i don't know whether they take out my my house i mean like there's no value like there's there's no value to attack something that's headless right because you're not going to move an objective forward you're going to actually just lose money lose lose um face you're going to embarrass yourself uh, you're going to uh, cost yourself a ton of money you're going to potentially piss off a bunch of individuals who would you know potentially arm and have more industrial might than you and then maybe they would wipe you off the face of the planet because you have every right to defend yourself. So like if, if another country were to attack us for some reason, we have every right and every um, moral authority based upon NAP to go and uh, defend ourselves, right? So when they when they kind of land on our shores and defend, et cetera. So, so it makes no sense. It makes no sense whatsoever. And we can go through like a, a deeper dive wargaming scenario and I'll actually link to another video that's done some of that and um, it, on DROs and we'll, we'll do that for another topic in terms of how could this scenario or this solution not work, right? And what would be the risk mitigation and how do we make it work? But um, I've walked through all of the potential scenarios in the past and there's not a scenario where we couldn't risk mitigate or solve, right? But the idea is, is through these insurance companies that would be auditing people, that would be making everyone aware of these issues, um, it would solve a lot of these problems, right? So then the next ones are really kind of lower level, so they're not like worrying about massive militarization and um, how do we defend ourselves in a very large scale front. It's really just how do we solve disputes, like I mentioned, like contract disputes, um, how do we get standards, you know, people to interact and integrate with each other? Uh, how do we get individuals, say like neighbors to negotiate with each other? And of course, like I mentioned earlier, self-defense. So the key, the key ones are the, these distribute resolution orgs would be similar to courts in the fact that they would be, um, private organizations where you would sign a contract, like let's say in business today, all businesses define contracts and they define what happens if you breach the contract, where, where you solve, you know, where, who your arbitrator is right now. Most people default to the government, of course. Right. So you'll define that, Hey, I'm doing business in California and we're going to use California courts and federal courts to, you know, resolve disputes in accordance with law. Right. But in the free market, we wouldn't, we would again do that, but we would just say, Hey, we agree in this standard, in this DRO's law practices, which, you know, of course have been market tested and they have measurements behind how successful it protects contracts and how, uh, what the percentage of breach of contracts is because you follow these rules, etc. So again, it's, it's rules, but not rulers, right? That's the whole point of all of this. So we're building a world with rules, but not rulers. And you get to voluntarily choose your rules and who arbitrates those rules, right? And so that's how you solve this. Again, this, this is the answer to these problems like this. And this is this is basically what we're doing. So this, this question was really good. It was really wrapped around, um, you know, what we're trying to solve and where we're going, right? But, and the final one I, I just wanna kind of get into before we wrap up is basically peer negotiation. So on a peer to peer level, like I mentioned, your neighbor, if you have an issue um, over your property lines or over uh, someone not paying their road fee, du fee duties or whatever, all that stuff, again, would go to a, a dispute resolution org that, you know, you could choose to go to as an insurance. So it'd be a combination of arbitrator and insurance. So what happens is in a scenario where you may have neighbors that, you know, aren't entering into a formal contract with you, 
um, that's you know, heavily written in, it's defining recompense and it's defining who's going to arbitrate, etc. Then what you would do is you would buy insurance and you would say, okay, well, um, I'm going to buy $10,000 worth of neighborhood insurance, which will say, which will protect me if my neighbor does something um, to violate my property. Now, it doesn't mean they have to do something violent. But let's say, you know, they start to build something on your property or they, uh, you know, or, or they don't pay the road fees, etc. And then from there, you would get this insurance and they would pay you back for what you, you know, kind of what you're owed based on the damages that happened to you or your property. And then they would go after this person and say, hey, look, you violated these terms. You should you now need to pay. Right. And here's what you violated and here's what's wrong. And this is, you know, and of course, there'd be steps before that. You've, you, you know, the, the organization would send letters saying, hey, please don't build on this piece of property. Please pay your your bills as you agreed to in the, in the road contract, etc. And, you know, try to solve the dispute through negotiation, uh, understand what the problem is. You know, is that person just having financial problems? Is this person uh, don't see doesn't see value in the road fund anymore? All these other things. Right. So there would be a multi layer process to kind of solve these peer negotiations up to um you know basically asking them to pay fines or fees and, that, and again this would not be violence based so i would not say at the end of this pay or go to jail we would say at the end of this pay or just like your credit score we're going to publicly rate you and there will be lots of credit rating agencies and then so when this person goes to do business with someone else in the future they'll look up their credit score or the reputation score or whatever online um which which in, in in a lot of scenarios that were you know there's a lot of crypto people building public reputation systems as well that are easily accessible and you can find out people's reputation then you would say okay well look this person isn't worth doing business with he didn't solve this dispute from you know 10 years ago and I, he's a risk. And so I'm either going to charge him or I'm not going to do business with him. And so in that way, in the ostracism model, in the reputation based model, you know, kind of like credit scores, we start to mold people's behavior in the right way. Right. Because they can't really collaborate in a society unless they're following, you know, reasonable uh, societal kind of forms of negotiation and collaboration, etc. So that's how you solve those those problems right that are that are inherent in this question and what this question was asking and the, and again none of none of these solutions have violence not one right and so you know this solution is 10 times better than anything we have today in the government guaranteed like at least you start here and you refine it as we go along right and anyway so that's the whole point of um, what we're doing here at Freedom Solutions DAO and and luckily this question was actually really great because it kind of helped get us some uh, an opportunity to talk a little bit deeper about why we're doing what we're doing uh, here at the show and hopefully answer this question uh, for this for this gentleman. So um, to that end, I just want to highlight real quick um, what we're doing on the show and why that question relates to the show. So obviously what this show as well as the software we're building out of the show is all designed to build functional pro you know functional prototypes right prototypes which are mature enough to actually express the basic solution um, robust enough to kind of get some of the features out there it's all open source everything we're doing is open source both the content the video the the software that we produce everything else we're looking for people to collaborate we're looking for people to um, help us write some of the code, uh, help us, you know, you know, and mature the ideas, mature the systems behind these, behind these different solutions. And uh, some of our first three we're going to start with are UberGuard. So again, this is how we decentralize defense and safety. Uh, science Starter, which is how we build, uh, take science and implement it into products in a decentralized way without having to, you know, have all these layers of academia that uh, that are kind of controlled by big business and controlled by government today. And uh, DTube, which is a decentralized version of YouTube. So um, join us, help us. Uh, we'd love your input. We'd love your feedback. And we'd love to um, see you guys collaborate to help build this. So um, with that, if you guys want to learn a bit more uh, and you want to move into kind of a deeper level of what we're trying to do, 
uh, in terms of actually understanding what our first initiatives are, you know, how Freedom Solutions is, is constructed as a decentralized autonomous organization, kind of what some of that stuff means, then uh, hit the links down here at the bottom where it shows the PowerPoint. It shows you some details behind what we're doing. Also hit that video that's down there and that'll walk you through the overview of kind of what, who we are, what we are, how we're going to change the world and how this applies to the, you know, certainly to this question, right? So we're building the answer to this gentleman's questions, right? Um, last part I just want to talk about is is basically, you know, the way we, we are building the revenue model behind the show uh, is really focused on donations. So the entire, the, this entire show, you know, how we perform the show, how we execute the show, how we build, you know, what gives us the runway to build our code, what fuels uh, the ability for us to, to do these things like, like do the show, collaborate with you guys, build the code and everything else is all based on donations. So we're 100% donation, uh, donation based, uh, which the key reason why is so that we can be accountable to you. So, you know, we're dealing with some pretty challenging stuff in terms of what we're trying to do in the marketplace, both in terms of how it affects corporations, as well as how it affects government, how it affects societal interactions. And if we were to take advertising or if we were to have kind of a, a separate investor model, then we would be accountable to those people and not accountable to you. And so donations really are, um, it's, it's kind of me at this point in time, I'm looking for people to help out with the show, but all the donations help me, you know, focus all my attention on this um, and help me remain accountable just to you. So please donate, please subscribe, please like, and please, please give me your feedback and continue to give me these questions uh, so we can kind of help build up more uh, answers for what you guys are specifically looking for. And thank you so much. Talk to you soon.